Good evening, my name is Cheryl Peach. I'm the director of Scripps Educational Alliances here at UC San Diego Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Welcome to the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science Speaker Series. This evening, we're delighted to welcome two speakers, Amato Evan and Jillian Schaefer Lutzko, to learn about their very different but related perspectives on a very interesting topic, and that is dust in the area around the Salton Sea. We'll hear from each of them and then have time for a moderated discussion with some prepared questions that I have and then questions from you in the audience so that we can learn more about the work and the intersections between uh, the two disparate but connected fields of climate science and architecture. Amato is a climate scientist here at Scripps and a professor in the Climate, Atmospheric Sciences, and Physical Oceanography section at Scripps. Prior to coming to Scripps, Amato was an assistant professor at the Department of Environmental Sciences at the University of Virginia. His research here is multifaceted. He studies many things, of course. Uh, he studies uh, understanding how dust, um, dust storms form in the Salton Sea area and the dynamics of the formation of those dust storms. Uh, he looks at how dust impacts global climate and also how dust um, interacts with atmospheric rivers to control or not the precipitation that we see coming from those atmospheric rivers and many, many other topics um, in um, climate-related fields. Jillian is the current Citizen Architect Fellow at the University of Southern California School of Architecture and is also the founder of the Southern California-based practice Studio Schaefer Lutzko. Her research interests center around the question of how architecture should respond to the most pressing issues uh, of our time, including things like the ongoing climate crisis, um, how we can broaden our understanding of individual and cultural identities through architecture, worsening economic inequity, and the societal and cultural impacts of new technologies on space and visual media. Please join me in welcoming both Amato and Jillian for their talks and the panel discussion titled Dust in the Salt and Sea, Urban Design for the Climate Crisis. Thank you, Amato and Jillian. All right, hello. Um, so right here, you've been looking at a picture of a dust storm about 100 miles east of here, uh, just outside of the Salton Sea, just west of the Salton Sea. And this is a picture taken atop Split Mountain. And if you could see it, kind of on the right side of the screen, there would be a town of Ocotillo Wells and a small airport there. But they're obscured by all the dust that's being lifted off the desert and transported into the atmosphere. So to, to start, I want to note the interesting diversity of ecosystems we have just right here in San Diego County. So obviously, we're at Scripps. Right, this incredible uh, coastal environment. But you really just have to get in your car and drive east less than an hour, and you're in a montane ecosystem with mountain meadows, pine forests, and I think right now probably a little bit of snow from uh, the rainfall event, at least over here, that we had last night. But interestingly, if you just keep going maybe another 30 minutes, those mountains plunge down into the, the uh, Anza Desert, very steeply, and, and we have this hyper-arid desert environment. This is a picture of Clark Dry Lake Bed. And it's quite incredible. In, in an hour and a half, you can go through so much diversity of environments. And if you continue to drive east, about another hour, maybe 45 minutes, depending on how fast you drive, you'll end up here, right in the middle of this image. This is the Salton Sea. And just for a little reference, on the left-hand side, obscured by those clouds, this is where we are right now. Um, and then obviously the Salton Sea into the north and the south of the, the Salton Sea, uh, we have a lot of uh, irrigation. But then to the east and the west and really all around, we have desert regions and then uh, mountains. And this area is prone to dust storms. It's a dry, very incredibly dry environment. And this is one of those dust storms from October of last year. So you can see the, the brown clouds of dust riding above the Salton Sea itself and over the lands that are capped by uh, meteorological clouds just above them. Dust storms happen in this region quite often. We think on the busiest month of the year, March, 
possibly even once every two or three days, probably somewhere on the order of 80 to 100 dust storms per year. Some large like this and some quite a bit smaller. If you were on the ground that day in October, you might see something like this, about a 3,000 foot tall wall of dust approaching you somewhere between 30 and 50 miles an hour. And after that dust storm hit you, it might look a little bit like this. This is my graduate student, Alex, out making some measurements, but well prepared for all the dust that would otherwise enter her eyes and her teeth and maybe inside of her ears as well. So the Salton Sea uh, hasn't always looked like this. And let me just note that this is a terminal basin. That means that if you were to go along the shoreline of the Salton Sea and walk in any direction away from the water, you would be going uphill. So everything in this, uh, in this area flows down into the Salton Sea. Now, on geological time scales, the Colorado River, which unfortunately I don't have a pointer, but it's very off to the far right of this, this picture, the Colorado River would meander into this basin and it would fill it up, creating a, uh, an ancient lake that would then, then the Colorado River would meander out and it would dry up. And so this would happen on long time scales. The last time we think this happened was somewhere around 5,000 years ago, call that ancient Lake Cahuilla. Um, and in fact, if you just drive, for example, along the shore, along the mountains that border this basin, you might find something like this. These are freshwater mussel, shells from freshwater mussels that were probably deposited in the region maybe some 3,000 years ago. But the modern Salton Sea uh, is something quite a bit different in that in the late 19th century, uh, some folks realized that this is probably an excellent place to grow food given the proximity of the Colorado River and the ample sunshine. And so an effort began to create what was at the time a very ambitious uh, um, irrigation project to divert water from the Colorado River into this basin. And as people often do, there was a miscalculation, and that miscalculation was not taking into account the variations in the strength of the Colorado River, particularly in the springtime. And so my understanding, and probably what happened is in the winter of 1904 and 1905, it was a heavy snow year in the Rockies. Subsequently, in the spring of 1905, the river burst all of the levee systems, and essentially the Colorado River was diverted into the Salton Basin for five years before they were able to repair the um, levee system and, take, and uh, divert the Colorado River back towards the Gulf of California. And some of you might be familiar maybe with some of the um, failed attempts to convert the Salton Sea, what, was, what, what had been created artificially uh, over 100 years ago into maybe a uh, tourist destination, particularly around the time that Palm Springs was exploding in popularity, there were a lot of hopes to turn the north shore of the Salton Sea into a vacation destination. But the problem is, is that, again, it's a terminal basin, and so water flows into the Salton Sea, but it doesn't flow back out. However, water leaves the Salton Sea through evaporation, and that evaporation, because it's so hot out there, that evaporation can outstrip the water that's flowing in. And so over time, the sea becomes more salty. The sea is very shallow, um, and as a result of the sea being very shallow and the salty levels, occasionally there are massive fish kills that occur. And so this project to convert the Salton Sea into a vacation uh, uh, destination didn't quite work out the way folks had planned. Furthermore, back in the 1960s, there was actually a hurricane that traveled up through the basin um, and destroyed a lot of the infrastructure. And, and so now, what a lot of people think about the Salton Sea are scenes kind of like this, basin, basically abandoned infrastructure. Um, but that really doesn't tell you everything that happened. Certainly, there is an element of um, disaster tourism that happens in the region. But it's also a biologically very interesting place. And in fact, the Sunny Bono National Wildlife Refuge, which is at the southern end of the Salton Sea, is a hugely important uh, migratory bird stopover point, particularly because in California we've developed so many of our coastal wetlands. So what's happening, though, with the Salton Sea right now is that its size is shrinking. Here's a satellite image of the Salton Sea in the year 2000 and 2022. As I toggle between these two images, particularly if you look around the southern end of the Salton Sea, the western shoreline, the northern shoreline, you can really get a sense that this large inland body of water is shrinking. Now, the reason why the Salton Sea is shrinking, again, because of the evaporation. There's always a demand. The atmosphere 
is always trying to take water out of the Salton Sea. But also, over time, the flow of water going into the Salton Sea has shrunk partially because agricultural runoff was a huge uh, input of water into the Salton Sea, and partially because in the year 2003, there was an agreement reached between California, Nevada, Arizona, something called the Quantification Settlement Agreement, in which California was forced to not use as much of the Colorado River water as it was, or I guess we were using more, the state was using more than it should have, and, and it was told it had to stop. And particularly starting in the year 2017, there's been a huge drop in the amount of water entering the Salton Sea. And as that has happened, we've seen a huge decline in the level of the sea and a huge increase in the amount of what we would call exposed playa. These are areas that used to be underwater, but that are now exposed to the atmosphere. So this raises a question, how are dust storms in this area going to change as that Salton Sea shrinks, and as we have this growth in the exposed playa? Well, if we want to answer that question, we can really just look to the past. And right here, what we're looking at is Owens Dry Lake, which used to be called Owens Lake, until Los Angeles, back about 100 years ago, decided to divert the water from Owens Lake, which is about 400 miles to our north, down into, at the time, which was an exploding population, to give the, the exploding population in, in LA um, enough water to survive. And so you can all see evidence of this um, action if you travel on the I-5 north out of Los Angeles. And if you are in an arid region like the Owens Lake is, and you have a lake, and then you take off, take the water out of that lake, well, what you end up is generating dust storms. And so this is a, a dramatic dust storm coming off of that Owens Lake, and that dust is being lifted up into the atmosphere, and it's actually capped by a uh, very large lenticular cloud. So this is a cloud created by a mountain. We can also look further away. In Central Asia, the Aral Sea was one of the world's great inland bodies of water. And in the 1970s, 1980s, the Soviet Union decided to start diverting water that would have been running off into the Aral Sea for agriculture, but particularly uh, to grow cotton to make clothing. So this resulted, again, in a reduction of water going into a great inland sea that is in an arid region. So that evaporative demand, water is continually evaporating off into the ocean. And so we can see in the 1980s, the, the Aral Sea was converted into a North Aral Sea and a South Aral Sea. And as we continue on into the 2000s, that South Aral Sea diminished until what we have right now is just a tiny sliver of water on the, uh, in the uh, western flanks of what was once the South Aral Sea. And scenes like this. Boats hundreds of miles, well, rusted out boats, hundreds of miles from the nearest navigable water, and dust storms. Again, if you take a body of water in an arid region and you remove that water, you end up with a, an environment that's pretty darn good for creating dust. So the Salton Sea, though, in addition to us removing the water, is particularly a good place to have a dust storm because of the orography, because of the mountains surrounding the area. Those mountains generate high wind speeds. And the reason why has to do with what I started this talk off about, about how we can, can go through all these different environments as we travel east from here. The slopes on the mountains, this western, uh, the western slopes of the peninsular mountains are relatively gradual, but those eastern slopes are incredibly steep. And what this does is it, it is a prime way to create waves in the atmosphere if the wind is traveling from west to east, which it oftentimes does here. And the way that this happens is very similar to water in a stream flowing over some kind of barrier. As that water flows over the barrier, it accelerates as it plunges downward and then creates a standing wave in the, in the lee of that barrier, down, downstream of the barrier, and turbulent flow as well, as you can see with those, that, uh, how the water is turning white. So this wave pattern that's created by water flowing over the barrier the same thing happens in the atmosphere. In this case, the mountains are the barrier and the air in the atmosphere is the water. And as that air plunges down in the lee of the mountains, and right here we're looking at, on the left, those are the Sierra Nevada, the eastern slopes of the Sierras, which are incredibly steep. And on the right, again, we're looking at Owens Valley. As that air plunges down those mountains, um, we create a wave over the Owens Valley. And that wave generate, in, associated with that wave are incredibly strong surface winds and the type of environment that's excellent for lifting dust up into the atmosphere and transporting it long distances. So the Salton Sea is in decline, 
And we have every reason to think that it, there's going to be more dust as the sea continues to shrink. And it's going to continue to shrink. So there's a big question here. Well, how much more dust? Is it 10% more? I mean, we already have pretty large dust storms out there. Is it 50% more, 100, maybe 200% more? Those are the kinds of questions I'd like to know. And unfortunately, I don't really have an answer to that. But also, how does that increasing dust then change, for example, the weather? The fact that we can see a dust storm means that the, those dust particles are interacting with light. They're changing the energy in the Earth's atmosphere. They also interact with infrared radiation, almost like heat in the atmosphere. Those dust particles can interact with clouds, changing cloud properties, changing the types of clouds that we see. Now, obviously, if you live in the area, you probably really want to know how is that dust storm, how is that change in dust, or how will that increasing dust affect the air quality? Already in that region, that is the area, Imperial Valley has the highest rate of childhood asthma. And it's hard to believe that increasing dust is going to make that problem go, uh, make that problem any better. There are other human health concerns besides respiratory diseases. Just something as simple as the poor air quality leading to increased uh, vehicular accidents. There's also economic concerns. If you have dust storms, especially in an agricultural region, the abrasion of dust onto vegetation can actually diminish the agricultural productivity of a cropland. And there's also the question of solar power generation. As dust is deposited onto solar cells, um, this, it's an action called soiling, reduces the amount of energy that can be generated. And I also want to broaden this out a little bit. I'm talking about the Salton Sea, but we live in an arid state. A good chunk of our state actually is, is quite dry. And we get dust storms all over. Right here on the left, this is a satellite image of a dust storm in the Central Valley. The top right is the Owens Valley again. And the bottom right, this is a dust storm, uh, the famous 1977 dust storm um, in Bakersfield, where it was reported that the winds were so strong, reportedly over 100 mile an hour winds, and there was so much dust that it actually sandblasted the paint jobs off of vehicles in the area. I haven't seen any pictures, but that's at least what the, the, the news says. So I think uh, California is heading towards a more dusty future. And there are a couple reasons why that's the case. One of them, again, is that we live in this arid region, but also that we have a lot of demands on water here in our environment. But yet, the water that's coming out of the atmosphere isn't really keeping up with our demands. Over the last 40 years, we've had a decline in the amount of snowpack in the Sierras. I'm sure everybody here has saw news reports about declining levels in Lake Mead and Lake Powell as well. So the Colorado River is also in distress. But there's this other feature of global warming that exacerbates the problem. And that is that with global warming, as temperatures rise, the land temperatures rise more rapidly than the ocean temperatures. And that has the net effect of essentially making the air more thirsty, but the ocean can't keep up with the atmosphere's thirst. And so it creates increasing aridity in already arid regions. And that is definitely not a good sign if you live in a region where you might experience dust storms. Because increasing aridity then uh, reduces your vegetation cover, which then increases the speed of the winds at the surface, which then increases the availability of material at the surface that can be lofted into the atmosphere. So I think all of these questions for the salt and sea can broadly be applied to the state that we're living in right now. And I just want to do a, a last little plug here for a new effort um, by myself, 10 of my colleagues at six different UCs, um, where we want to try to address this problem. It's something that we're not really seeing the state uh, take any kind of leadership on. And there are a lot of questions that need to be answered before we can really start to address what we think might be a crisis in dust storms in the state, including just increasing our physical understanding, quantifying the risk associated with dust storms, who is at risk even, all the different types of impacts, um, with the goal of improving resiliency in the state, basically better enabling the citizenry here to manage um, what we think is a likely outcome of increasing dust storms in our future. So that's it, thanks. Uh, thank you to Amato for a great presentation on dust at the Salton Sea, and Cheryl for the kind introduction and for organizing tonight's perspective event. 
Um, my name is Jillian Schaefer, and I lead the architecture and design practice studio Schaefer Let's Go. And tonight I'm going to share what was originally two projects in development at the Salton Sea done under the same umbrella of research. Um, this project, supported by the National Endowments for the Arts and the Ford Foundation, investigates how the built environment can be used to visualize changing climates, address the social, economic, and health impacts of climate, as well as transform public space around shared resources and knowledge. So to begin with a little quote, um, our conception of things like air, ocean, uh, rock, ice, and weather condition our engagement with them. Uh, this could mean many things for the field of architecture. Perhaps most central is the recognition that our environment is not just a resource to be managed or an externality to which we must adapt, but one of the chief figurations of shared or contested cultural values. Um, so in the past, sustainability efforts have mostly consisted on new constraints and greenwashing of design. So um, as many of you might have heard of these certifications and construction and lead building standards, uh, they um, have been modified and have replaced a lot of vernacular and traditional building techniques. Um, so however, we don't usually think of architecture as a vehicle for visualizing climate change and engaging with the intersection of topics that are in direct relationship to climate, such as social justice, the economic drivers of extractive processes like lithium mining uh, and land ownership. National media, uh, air, ocean, rock, and the material we've been discussing tonight, dust, bring materiality to some of the values ascribed to climate, and they force us to think about what architecture is and does. So um, here you see some images of dust. Dust is both ubiquitous and often goes unnoticed, but has a huge impact on climate, as a motto has shown, and on society. So famously, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein in the year without a summer in 1860, which was caused by volcanic ash in the eruption of Tambora. We can see dust from space. Dust also has a connotation of uprooting and moving populations, as we saw in the Dust Bowl. Um, its pervasiveness can be associated with ideas of revolution, protest, migration, as the dust rolls in, and so on. At a finer scale, you can dust for fingerprints, but also the verb to dust implies the maintenance and energy that goes into getting rid of dust. Um, and lastly, a lot of dust going into the atmosphere from arid deserts comes from fossils, creating a link between the present state of the atmosphere, the weather, and the distant past. Um, so as I mentioned, dust is kind of this medium for which the atmosphere gains materiality. So picked up by wind gusts over arid depressions, dust is carried vast distances by passing weather and patterns, illustrating the swirly eddies and jets which make up the atmosphere's circulation. So this is a satellite image showing the vast quantities of dust that blows over sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and over uh, 100 million tons per year pass over the Atlantic, where it fertilizes the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, seeds hurricanes, and sinks to the ocean floor, where nutrients are provided for phytoplankton. And through dust, uh, there are many telescoping scales from its microscopic composition to its global scale of its transport. Um, so as Amato also showed, we cannot talk about dust without talking about shrinking lakes. So although it's called the Salton Sea, the Salton Sea is a lake. There are many prototypical examples of lakes which have shrunk during the 20th century to leading to more dust in the atmosphere. So one case study prevalent, um, as Amado also mentioned, being the Owens Lake, though different in its scale, uh, the landscape and built environment at Owens Lake can be an example of how we expect the Salton Sea to change in the near decades. Um, so the Salton Sea is also the first body of water in which many migrants encounter when crossing the border and the reason for why there are settlements around the area. Um, the history of the Salton Sea is one of flow and fluctuations. So periodically when the Colorado River overflows its boundaries, giant lakes form the Salton Sea and before that the larger Lake Cahuilla. And these bodies of water support vibrant ecosystems, nomadic tribes, agriculture, and all manners of lives and economies. So years later, the riverbeds river silt up, the, the river is diverted south, and the region has dried up. So in these past few decades, the Salton Sea has already experienced a substantial reduction in area. 
uh, at the intersection of Riverside, Imperial Valley, and San Diego counties. The Salton Sea has received water resources from San Diego and Los Angeles to maintain and sustain local ecosystems, industry, and population. Amato also showed kind of some of these uh, schemes for the Salton Sea. So in fact, the Salton Sea has been a vibrant place for urbanism and as a tourist destination. So in the 1960s and 70s, the sea attracted more visitors per year than Yosemite National Park. In the same way, since the scope of the environmental crisis in the Salton Sea first revealed itself in the 70s, efforts to hold back these shifts and effects have oscillated. Uh, task forces are set up, studies are commissioned, management and renewal plans are outlined. But before real change can be implemented, interest wanes, funding is withdrawn, and focus shifts to another apparently more pressing crisis. So how then can real change be achieved in a region with rapidly changing environmental and lived conditions where the landscape is fragile and funding is precarious? Today, the Salton Sea is home to many communities uh, which face the dilemma of worsening dust conditions while not being able to physically move from the climate affected region. So while many inhabitants dream of uh, leaving, the widespread issues around respiratory health mean that those, uh, even with the ability to leave, will feel an obligation to stay behind and take care of families. And 20% of children in the area are born with asthma due to dust aerosols. So there have been a number of infrastructural strategies identified for suppressing dust, such as weighted gravel and nets to slow the transport of dust. And as the shoreline recedes, the newly exposed lake bed or playa is the prime source for dust emissions. So this is a photograph of the newly exposed pilot, playa <laughs> at the northern shore, which has been the primary site uh, for this project in collaboration with Alianza Coachella Valley. So now I'll transition a little bit to speaking more about the master plan and architectural projects that we've been working on at the North Shore sites with them. Um, so we were inspired by Frederick Law Olmsted's seven mile long emerald necklace in Boston, which consists of a thousand acre chain parks linked by parkways and waterways in Brookline. The plan creates retreats for both passive and active recreation, including ecologically important urban wilds that provide nesting places for migratory birds and improves the air quality of the city. Our project envisions a new mode of urban design, which can combine socially programmed charms and urban elements along a path uh, connecting to the Coachella Valley link that already exists. The spaces created are flexible, reconfigurable, and dynamic. New structures are simple and easily constructed, even off the shelf. M uh, materials are humble, durable, and largely renewable or recyclable. Uh, modular elements reflect community needs. Uh, from recreation to entrepreneurship, culture and the arts, energy, recreation, um, play, infrastructure, and environmental protection. So here's the site. So the first phase connects an area of 2.4 miles from Albert Fry's North Shore uh, Beach and Yacht Club to the Salton Sea Beach State Recreation Area, including a land bridge that crosses over Grapefruit Boulevard. Um, the North Shore neighborhood has a population of about 2,580 people within 11 square miles, and notably the home of the Sunny Bono Wildlife uh, National Refuge. So these maps that you see here locate nearby uh, public transport hubs, wildlife habitats, bathymetric topos, and existing public programs. And the location of these public amenities play a role in the location of urban elements within the design proposal. So as I mentioned before in this image, uh, the master plan begins with a typical landscape path as an urban template for socially programmed charms that are flexible, reconfigurable, and dynamic. Um, recreation to entrepreneurship, culture and the arts, energy, recreation and play, infrastructure, environmental protection are all uh, modular urban elements that reflect the needs of the community. So ultimately, by situating new models of urbanism based on modular, resilient, and bottom-up principles, we claim that to design for climate crisis is an opportunity for new modes of design thinking and for urbanism to embrace a stronger social role. 
There's a changing nature of architectural practice in which architecture and urban design comes into actualization through the collaboration of public policy groups, nonprofits, and partnerships with community groups, tribal organizations, scientists, and local stakeholders. In this drawing, uh, you can see an example of a typical condition with regular intervals of lighting, planters, pedestrian, and bike paths, followed by prefabricated aluminum seating elements. There are spaces for play, spaces for art and sculpture paths, a pier element that creates a microenvironment within the center and maximizes docking along the perimeter, there are spaces for utilities, uh, which include infrastructural developments such as Wi-Fi and emergency safety stations. Uh, this drawing shows an access connection from a nearby single family uh, housing zone with a berm that creates a threshold that buffers the parking lot um, to additional means for mobility such as bicycle and scooter rentals. There are spaces for community gardens and leisure walks that peel from the main spine including spaces of dust suppression, such as netting, weighted gravel, permeable pavers, and roughing. And lastly, platform spaces for camping that vary in size and arrangement, all based off of modular sizing that can be applied across the urban elements more generally. Uh, this rending here shows a land bridge spanning over the railroad and Bay Drive, which connects an adjacent residential zone to the shoreline. Land bridges make it possible for animals and plants to gradually cross, opposed to fragmenting ecologies. Um, and then in this rendering, looking north towards the Albert Fry Yacht Club, the design provides a link that will be populated by urban elements, uh, shown a few slides back, as well as new structures. And the path uh, more or less acts as a catalyst for urban amenities and future development, including an educational center with a secondary use for climate research. So we've also been working on a one-to-one -one scale prototype with support from the National Endowments for the Arts, and this prototype will test the detailing of a facade system that interacts with dust and the visualization of change through the formation of a stratigraphy, um, which I'll explain a little bit more in the next couple of slides. Um, so from here, the example uh, for this structure is that it's divided into three programmatic bars one for research, one for education and community, and the third as a dormitory and shelter space for a research team. These three bars then orient to the prevailing wind directions. They create programmatic overlaps, which hybridize and inform one another of mixed interactions. Uh, and together they form a building envelope, which is then sealed by a dust membrane and outer skin. So lastly, the bars are calibrated uh, to curated views of the sea and also uh, of the dust that accumulates along the windows of the research space. In the building organization, you can see the three bars overlap. Uh, the research space with the two stratigraphies created on both sides, the community classroom, which cuts views back from the stratigraphy onto the west, which is visually linked to the sweeping views of the Salton Sea. And the purpose of this uh, dust that passes through the membrane and accumulates on the windows of the research space is the creation of a stratigraphy. So just as rocks form in layers representing changing environmental conditions, the dust that would accumulate uh, creates a changing, a record of the changing climatological conditions. Um, so as new parts of the lake bed are exposed, the properties of the dust such as color and size of grain change and so do the layers. Here you can see the climatological layers or stratigraphy uh, forming around the window of the research space, which has um, been calibrated to the wind direction. So the stratigraphy would act as both scientific data and a visual illustration of the impacts of climate change at the Salton Sea. Um, so in other words, accumulation formed uh, by the dust would be a didactic tool for those who encounter it uh, to see time scales of environmental change. 100 years later, in 2125, the building creates a record that can be studied about the accelerated changes in the region uh, and accumulates dust onto its walls until further encapsulated. Um, so this project is at the intersection of multiple time scales. The time scales for humans in which a human might observe the environmental change, the time scale of a building, 
uh, which stands through its materiality and material cycles, the climatological scale on which regional weather changes, and the geological scales on which all of it is recorded through the medium of dust. And this is just a quick thank you to the partners and sponsors of this project. So Alianza Coachella Valley, the Torres Martinez Desert, Cahuilla Indians, the National Endowments for the Arts, the Ford Foundation, the University of Southern California School of Architecture, and the University of San Diego. Thanks. Thank you both very much. I, I think that this is a wonderful time for us to ponder what you both have told us and to think a little bit and perhaps ask um, both of you about the intersections of your work. And so I have a few questions, but I would like for all of you in the audience to please uh, save up your questions because uh, once we've gotten warmed up with this moderated discussion, it will be your turn to ask questions of both Amato and Jillian. And uh, I want to thank you both. Those were wonderful presentations, so highly visual, and of an area that I think uh, many of us are familiar with, uh, but perhaps uh, did not um, know or understand many of the details that you've related about both the, the climate in the area as well as the potential um, architectural wonders that, um, that could populate the shores there. Um, so m one of the questions that I have um, is that both of you, uh, both of your work and your projects um, are working towards rendering climate change, a vision of climate change <clears throat> that's visible through dust. Jillian, you just talked quite a bit about that. Um, could you talk a little bit about the media that you work in? Um, and it's quite different for both of you and also the audiences that you're reaching with your work. Amato, for example, you work with data collection, scientific papers, you have a very specific audience. And Jillian, your work lives in the kind of wonderful drawings that you show us, the images, and then the physical materials you use. So could you please take a few moments and think about um, how those two work for, you, for both of you? Sure, I'll start. Um, yeah, so a lot of the work that we do uh, lives through drawings. So uh, as you know, architectural drawings can be used as tools of measurement to construct buildings, but they can also be used as conceptual tools uh, or design communication more largely. So like conveying ideas like tonight uh, for projects um, that have not yet come into actualization. Uh, as far as also working in materials, so I think this project has been quite different from other projects that I've worked on in the past just because um, we're kind of working with materials and physics and trying to actually come up with uh, facade detailings that could collect dust so that it could be a tool for hopefully scientists. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, I think maybe this isn't exactly what you were asking, but one, one aspect of the um, studying dust storms that's very interesting is that dust storms involve both the atmosphere and the landscapes. And so um, studying what's creating a dust storm in the Salton Sea isn't necessarily just about trying to understand what the atmosphere is doing, but it's trying to understand that interaction between the atmosphere and the landscape. And so how is vegetation changing as the climate is changing is, is a huge thing. How does the landscape change on even short time periods? For example, there can be a gigantic rainstorm and it takes an area where dust might have blown and it creates an hexagonal type of crust all over the landscape that is really stable. But then over a period of weeks or maybe months, that landscape starts to break down. As far as how you know, taking that information and trying to communicate it, um, that's a little bit tricky because oftentimes the measurements that we make, um, I showed, I'll try to show a lot of what I think are pretty pictures, right? But actually collecting the data is, is, a, is not quite as visually a, appealing as that because we launch a weather balloon and you get a bunch of numbers back. Mm -hmm. And so then it's this long process of trying to convert those numbers into these uh, conceptual understanding that then you can communicate. And so even though I'm writing maybe scientific papers, oftentimes at the end of the paper, we try to, uh, try to communicate the main ideas or the main understanding through something that's a bit more visual and hopefully, hopefully more intuitive. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, no, that, that was great. It was, uh, it was uh, a complicated multi-part question. I do have one more that's uh, 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 perhaps a little more 
to a better understanding of how you do your work. And I wonder if you both could talk a little bit about your workflow. So you showed beautiful pictures, Amato, but what types of tools and technology are integral to carrying out your work? Um, and, and what kinds of sites are interesting and most productive for you to work at? And the same question for you, Jillian. Yeah, so, the, the type I, so we've actually built a research site out in the Salton Sea. Um, and the instrumentation, for example, I'm sorry we don't have a picture, but we'll go, we launch weather balloons. And weather, it's a large balloon. By the time it, it reaches the stratosphere and pops, it, which is kind of a funny thing yes. now. Ironic but, to talk about yeah. that now. <laughs> or not, yeah. or not. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, it carries a small little device that's, that's always beaming down some information, how warm it is, and what the pressure is, and how windy it is. These very things that seem really basic. In fact, I had a reporter out there once, and they couldn't believe that we still launch balloons and put them in the atmosphere. But that's actually the primary way that we try to understand what's, what's happening. But oftentimes, the tools I have, we call them like not direct observations, but remote observations. So for example, if I want to know how much dust there is in the atmosphere, it's, you can't take a UAV and fly it up there because it'll crash. Nobody wants to fly an airplane in the middle of the dust storm because it could actually choke off the engines or score the, the windows um, so that you couldn't see out. Um, so what we do is we shoot a laser straight up into the, the sky, and, and then as those uh, photons of light bounce back towards the instrument that shot them up, we try to infer from that how much where dust is in the atmosphere. So it's a lot of indirect measures, but particularly because it's, a, it's actually in the middle of a dust storm, it's, it's kind of a violent place to try to, to do work. Just to, because this is also a question I have for you, Amato. So um, when you locate your research station out by the Salton Sea, is it really the locations dependent on the access to internet, or is the western side of the shore better for collecting data than the Eastern. Right, so when it comes to trying to make a permanent field site in a place like a desert, it really comes down to two things. One is, is security, um, because if you've traveled out there, it, it, some, in some ways it feels a little bit lawless, and so we try to find a place where it's gonna be really hard for someone to find our stuff and mess, it, mess with it. Um, and it's really just as simple as that. But the other thing is, is to find a location where there is some availability of electricity, because all these instruments, they have to run on electricity, and we could use solar panels, but it just, it's a bit of a headache. So a lot of it is convenience, but there is a scientific element. For example, the kind of work that I do, I'm studying dust storms coming off of the Anza Desert, studying those mountain waves that are created, and it wouldn't be as good to go up to the northern end of the, the shore to do that, because they don't happen there quite as often. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and then to answer your question, Cheryl, about kind of like the site of architecture. So usually when we start working, um, we start with a schematic design phase, which involves research. So for this kind of project, it was looking at the Salton Sea more generally before even having a site. Um, and then once we were approached by Alianza Coachella Valley, it kind of narrowed down to the northern shore of the sea in which, um, like a typical architectural project, you would require a geotechnical survey. Um, actually, I put a slide one more further, if you click, Cheryl. Um, so <laughs> this is kind of, since you're asking about technologies, this is a group of students we went out to the Salton Sea in October, and we used LIDAR scanning to spatially map uh, our site. So this is how we got all of the topography and measurements. So we went out there with these LIDAR scanners and put all these orbs out uh, and mapped it into a digital model. And then from there, we really moved into design development and now uh, construction documents. So the workflow is kind of between working at a desk, producing drawings, but also being on field and understanding some of the t topography relationships and also um, how the shoreline will recede um, and kind of predicting that the design will be responding to the future of what that shoreline will look like. So I'm gonna ask one more question and then turn it over to you, the audience. Um, and my question is, um, Amato, you showed other sites like Owens Valley the, uh, and Owens Lake. And I wondered um, how might your methodologies, both yours and yours, Jillian, apply to other sites impacted by climate change, um, whether it's sites that are the typical sort of desert, desertification sites or maybe other aspects of, uh, of changing climate. Um, how do you integrate that into your, 
thinking about your science and your design, respectively. Well, definitely the hope is that what we learn observing, in, in, in effect, what's happening out in the Salton Sea is, is rapid climate change. And it's, it's rapid because there's this huge human element that's changing the landscape there. So the processes that I suspect we are going to be seeing over the next 10 years in the Salton Basin, in theory, are going to be playing out in arid regions over the next 50, 60, 70, 80 years globally. And so th the idea is that what we learn is sufficiently general that it can be applied to other arid landscapes. Um, maybe this is a bit of a way <laughs> of answering the questions like for architecture at, at large, but um, so Architecture is always responding to society and technology. It's moving quite quickly. And I would say climate change is only kind of newly on the radar of designers and architects. Um, so there have been some projects mostly about flooding. Um, so sea level rise in Miami, uh, the Big U Park by the Danish architect Bjarke Ingels have been kind of you know coming up the past couple of years. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, there are all these case studies of other arid deserts um, with shrinking lakes, but I wouldn't say that like urban design has uh, addressed it yet as far as adaptation or uh, regenerative projects as much as we'd like to see. So I think a lot of that is uh, a new field or a new territory to, to think about. I'm going to now turn to you in the audience to uh, ask questions that you might have for either of our speakers. And I'll ask you to ask your question, then I'm going to repeat it so that um, we have, uh, so that everybody in the audience can hear it. So can I see hands? So the question is, since the research site and the architectural site are at opposite ends of the lake, um, why, why are you not collaborating on the, on co-locating uh, the two efforts? Is that so the plan is it will be co-located. So the master plan would first happen as a template, um, kind of with these different kind of plugins I was talking about. And then once that kind of tissue connects point A to point B, then buildings would be built on that. So the idea is that the community center would be built off of the master plan. They would be together. So the public would visit the community classroom and be able to witness um, scientists work on climate change like Amato's. But, but I, I have to admit that the, the research site that we put together was, was on, I mean, I think Jillian's stuff is going to last a lot longer than mine. So. <laughs> 100 years at least. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. The, uh, so the question is about funding and whether the interests are mostly local, state, or, or federal or national in terms of funding to come up with um, solutions for some of the issues facing this region. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, yeah, so um, the funding is a tricky thing. For example, federal agencies, right, so who cares? The people that live out there care a lot, right? I mean, they care a whole lot. And, and I always feel a little bad because I'm thinking, oh, the little science thing that I'm doing and that's so interesting to me. But ultimately, you know, they probably don't care that much. They just want a solution. And so if we're talking about, for example, me as an atmospheric scientist, the thing that I think of that, that I feel like, OK, might be useful is I would like to be able to predict how dust is going to be changing there over the next 20, 30, 40 years. If I live there, that's what I would want to know. But if you were to go to the national, a, a national funding agency, they would say, well, that's kind of a more of a local problem. But then you go to the, some of the state agencies. And I think maybe the, the state representatives from the area would probably say the same. And I've, I've heard them say that, that they feel like you know, that their area is basically ignored up in Sacramento. Um, I don't understand all of the ins and outs of funding. A lot of money does go there to that area, mostly to build stuff. And when I say build stuff, I mean like digging. It's not even building anything. It's like digging some rows in, in the soil to try to slow the wind speeds down or, or experimenting with putting a plant called iodine bush, which is, you know, uh, can survive in highly alkaline soils. To, to try to suppress the dust. So these dust suppression pilot activities um, that are really limited on, on scale. There's always been a promise of millions and millions of dollars going to that area exactly to address this problem. But again, I think the frustration for the, the folks living there, and this is what I've heard, is that nothing has happened. And, and in reality, 
when I go to community meetings there, people will say, I'm sick of scientists studying stuff. I want something done. Um, and it's just hard to find the right people to try to make that happen. So I don't really know where the funding is. And I, I honestly don't understand where all the money that is supposed to be allocated to that area goes. Um, the state has shown or a lot of interest in putting funding towards it uh, because they've made concrete plans to mine for lithium on the southern edge of the sea. Um, and that's going to be a huge impact uh, on the area in terms of industry and the people who would live there. So I think it's gotten attention from the state, but also uh, at a federal level because of the scope in which the Salton Sea is declining compared to other areas in the US. Um, I want to catch someone on this side because I feel like, <laughs> yes, the gentleman over here. So the question is, uh, there's an understanding that, that dust and other particulates can be transported vast distances, both vertically into the atmosphere and then vast distances like Saharan dust across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, and wondering whether the Salton Sea dust actually makes, makes, travels vast distances. Do you have an idea of how far that dust actually is transported? Yeah, so the dust is definitely transported outside of that basin towards oftentimes towards Arizona or maybe the south towards the Gulf of California. Exactly how far it goes, though, I really don't know. We don't have kind of the observational network to, to be able to see that really clearly. Um, and the, the fact is, too, is it's a smaller region. And so a dust storm from Africa or coming off of the Sahara are, are massive, massive events. I mean, they're continental in scale, so they're pretty darn easy to spot in a satellite image. Whereas oftentimes, these dust storms too, just like the one I, the, some of the images I showed, there's clouds over the top of the, of the dust storm. And so it's really hard then to see from a satellite, which is kind of the way that we see what the weather does on, on these large scales, it's really hard to see where the dust is going because there's clouds obscuring the dust itself. I know there were more hands out there. Yes, over here. So two questions. The first is, as, the, as evaporation continues in the lake, does it um, precipitate out more minerals, um, perhaps minerals that have value uh, from a mining perspective? And then uh, is there any sort of climatic feedback uh, from the dust that emerges from the drying lake bed um, in terms of uh, uh, how, how it might feedback within the climate system? So what I can say is hydrologists that study the, the salt and sea it, itself um, are very concerned and, and pretty much regularly say that it, it's essentially going to be turning into the Dead Sea because the, the salt levels are growing and they are going to continue to grow until maybe one day we divert the Colorado River back into the basin and refill it all, all over again, which is, is not going to happen. Um, as far as the feedbacks, that's, that's a really interesting point. Um, but the, the potentially the, there could be a little bit of that. But you know, if, if you go out to that area on a, on a summer day, it can be 115 degrees Fahrenheit. And the relative humidity can be 5%, 10%. So there's always going to be a huge, what we would call an evaporative demand. The atmosphere is just always going to be soaking up a lot of the water from the Salton Sea, much more, despite some dust storms, which potentially maybe cool off the temperature by 5 or 10 degrees. Fahrenheit, there's, there's always going to be a, a, an atmospheric thirst for the water that's in that sea. Is it possible to refill the Salton Sea from the Sea of Cortez? So there, there have been some proposals to, to try to pump water into the salt back in, up, up. Basically, you have to pump water uphill at some point and then back down into the, so it would flow down into the Salton Sea. I, I know, I, I don't know all the reasons why everybody says that that is going to be um, impractical, um, maybe because it's expensive, but certainly folks have talked, I mean, folks have even put together proposals for pumping water from the Pacific uh, over the, the Laguna Mountains here into, into the Salton Sea as well. Um, but the, the details of, of that, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. So the question. The, the question is, are, are the architectural drawings all uh, Im implying that there's water adjacent to the site uh, where these, um, these buildings are envisioned, these, these various charms are envisioned? Yeah, so the answer is no. <laughs> the rendering that I showed right at the end, the 2125, was showing that the shoreline had receded. 
So the idea is also that this path could be rebuilt every X number of years and would create rings, uh, which would then become filled with some of these programs. So it would ultimately be a master plan for a, a desert, um, like a desert template, but the renderings were also showing years after. So the, that pinkish one, I don't know if you can recall, that was a land drawing. <laughs> Well, thank you both very much. We are out of time, so I'd like to give another round of applause for our speakers.